This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're continuing our series on our vision and mission here at Warragul Anglican Church. And today we're talking about focused outreach, which is a significant uh, plank in our mission. Um, let me read to you the first of the three priorities listed in our vision document. It's this. Advance the gospel by focusing on a particular people group, families, especially blended and single parent families, and helping to meet their needs. So that's one of our priorities. Now, some people, when they hear that, might think, fantastic, that's, that's a great thing to do. How excellent. Others, when they hear it, they might not be so sure. They might think, wait a minute, I thought we were called to love everyone. Why would we limit ourselves here? Why focus on a particular group of people? Shouldn't we be loving everyone? Some people might even think it, it, it sounds a bit like uh, a marketing tactic or something, aiming for a particular segment of society just to reach them in particular. In fact, I think there are good reasons why focusing outreach efforts on a particular group of people is how God wants us and calls us to do mission. And I hope to show that today. And we're going to look at those two readings and we're going to see that they show that we must care for the people God cares for and we must adapt to reach the people that God's called us to reach. First, we must care for the, God, uh, for the people that God cares for. We'll look at Psalm 146 for this. Psalm 146, uh, it begins personally, praise the Lord my soul, I will praise the Lord all my life, I will pray, uh, sing praise to my God as long as I live. But then it, it puts a call out to everyone. Do not put your trust in princes. Do not put your trust in human beings who cannot save. Psalm 146 is a mission psalm. It's calling out uh, to people to praise God and to, to turn to him. And notice, as it said there, uh, princes can't save, human beings can't save. Don't put your trust in them. The assumption there, the people it's talking to, is people who need saving. Maybe people with uh, illness or injury, who would uh, naturally and reasonably look to human beings, a doctor or a hospital, to help them. Or maybe people who aren't safe in their own homes, who might look to a social worker or someone else to help them. Or maybe a single person, unable to get work, sinking into poverty, who is angry at the government for letting this happen to ordinary people. People in those situations, some things can be done for them some of the time, but sometimes, and eventually, in many cases, even the best efforts of doctors or social workers or the government they fail. They can't save. For all those people helping, they're just people. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. And on that day, their fame comes no more. But the psalmist is saying there is someone who can save them. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob and whose hope is in the Lord their God. This is what's behind all this talk about mission. It comes from a, an awareness that people need saving in all sorts of ways, both practical, physical ways uh, and in spiritual ways. And it comes from a desire to see them find real hope and real help that will last, that can only be found in God. And then the second half of the psalm talks about who it is God helps and why and, and how. I'm going to read a 
significant portions of it. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. He gives sleep to the hungry. He sets prisoners free. He gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. What's the common theme? We're seeing God's special concern for the poor and the disabled and the crushed and those who live outside their own home or land and for those without family. We see this again and again through scripture. We see it even in the people Jesus targets in his mission. Uh, Jesus gives us a scriptural example of this. He focuses his mission uh, in a couple of ways. He goes first to the lost sheep of Israel and tells his disciples, go to them, not to the Gentiles. But then even within the people, the lost sheep of Israel, he says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Not meaning that some people are okay, but meaning people who know that they need God's mercy. Those are the people that Jesus focuses on in his outreach. And as Jesus said, how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Because they don't need anyone. They're self-sufficient. And it's so hard for them to give that up and depend on God. So while God gladly welcomes all who turn to him, he especially cares for those in need. And that's why in our mission, we want to care for the people God cares for. Rose and I used to be um, part of a very intensely focused outreach. It was ministry to people who lived in a large government housing estate. And it was across the road from our church. And the church felt called to plant a congregation to reach these people. So they started meeting in a hall on one of these estate buildings. And they provided practical friendship and help and they built relationships. And everything about how church was done, how we met during the week, our home groups, it it was all from the point of view of saying, how can we care for these people that God cares for? And as we cared for them, we shared with them how ultimately God cares for them in a way that we will never be able to. And we encountered so many desperate needs that we couldn't fix and no one could fix. Human beings cannot save, but we told them about the one who could. Blessed are those whose hope is in the Lord. He will hear them. He will help them. And here at Warragul Anglican, through much prayer and discussion before my time, but many of you were here, Warragul Anglican discerned a call from God to reach out to a particular group that he cares for in Warragul. Families in need. Blended families, single parent families, struggling families. We want to help meet their needs but of course we know in fact no one will be able to meet them all and so as well as trying to meet their needs wherever we can we want to share with them about the one who can we want to care for the people God cares for but this will mean that we all need to Make decisions that change some things that we're used to. Just as um, serving people on the housing estates meant giving up our church building where we used to go to church and meeting in some new community hall, um, it meant adapting the music and the preaching and, and it meant saying goodbye to people who didn't come to the church currently. Only by making, being willing to make adaptations and changes can we care for the people that God calls us to care for? And so, second point, we must adapt to reach the people God's called us to reach. And that's what we see in our second reading from 1 Corinthians. Uh, there's a somewhat famous phrase from Paul there, uh, I have 
become all things to all people. Most of the time when I hear someone say that, uh, they're actually using it ironically. We can't, come on, be reasonable. We can't be all things to all people. In fact, I think that's exactly Paul's point. He's not saying he was all things to all people all the time. He was saying when he was with one group of people, he would be something to them. With another group of people, he would, he would act differently. With another group of people, he, he would adapt. So when he was with the Jewish people, he says, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. And we have an example of that in Acts 21, where Paul sponsored some men who were doing some Jewish uh, purification rites, and Paul joined in. Now, if you read Galatians or Romans, you know that Paul would never encourage Gentiles to do that. But when he was with the Jewish people, he was happy to do it. Um, But then in verse 21, to those not having the law, that is non-Jews, Gentiles, I became like one not having the law. So, for example, in Antioch and other places, uh, Gentile territory, Paul would eat with the Gentiles. That was forbidden by rabbinic law, something they shouldn't do. But he did it and he challenged Peter when Peter was hypocritical and, and backed away from doing it. This is how it looked. He said, you, you have to do this. This is about grace. It didn't mean you just do anything and that it's complete lawlessness, which is why Paul says, I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. But within what God um, calls Christians to, Paul says, I made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. What Paul's showing us here is really the pragmatics of mission. That if we're going to do mission at all, we must focus our outreach. Because outreach for one group won't work for other groups. In the housing estate uh, that we work with, one of the largest groups of people is a Muslim population. And when gospel partners that we might know go overseas to locations predominantly Muslim, they need to adapt in their dress, in what they eat and what they drink. And it was the same on the estates. If we want, were trying to do outreach and we said, well, let's have a, a Thursday night uh, men's fellowship group at the pub. It would have worked for some residents. There are heaps of people who would never set foot in a pub. We couldn't make it work. What worked for one wouldn't work for the other, and vice versa. On the other hand, there are are times when relaxing about that sort of thing helps with mission. So um, if we were trying to reach um, families from the kindergarten that our kids go to, one of our former kindergartens uh, that we were involved with would hold fundraising, bogan bingo nights and that sort of thing. Uh, And you'd book the table and you'd enjoy the night. And it helped if you could show them that that Christians could relax and enjoy themselves and people didn't need to be uptight and on their guard around them all the time. That was helpful for mission. But if you try to make your outreach cater for everyone at the same time, it will reach no one something I've been talking with parish counselling about um, and it's, it's in there in our mission documents but we're trying to um, sharpen our thinking about it I suppose uh, is thinking about how uh, one of the reasons for this is that people in a um, particular group they have similarities around what's possible for them in life where they're at in their stage of life their culture and so on um, part of loving them showing them practical help, but also wanting them, because we love them, to to know that God loves them, is helping to provide stepping stones so that they can uh, move from maybe just being in contact with us to um, being part of something that the church runs, just like a community group or something where they feel like they belong a bit, maybe to something like uh, introducing the gospel to them, maybe to being involved in church work or our Bible study. 
Uh, and each of those stepping stones needs to work for them. Uh, so um, I'll talk about that in a bit more. Um, what it looks like practically, uh, let's, let's think about what it looks like practically if, if we believe that we're called to focus on families in this. Um, it means that in all our decisions about what we will do or we won't do in outreach, we keep this people group in mind uh, as the people group that God has called us in our church to serve. And there are so many good ideas and things we, we could do. It's easy to say, yes, let, let's start something for non-English speakers. Or let's uh, find people who uh, are isolated and lonely and don't know anyone and, and reach them. Or, uh, you know, maybe we could serve the hospital in some way. These are all good things and, and God cares for all these people. But the point of having a vision and a mission is to guide our decisions and help us decide what we will do and what we won't do because we can't do everything. And so we need to ask, um, does this thing we're thinking of serve those that we're trying to reach? Uh, so for example, in, in that thing I was talking about, uh, say we want something um, to share the gospel with people. Well, we might decide to run an alpha, a gospel intro course that happens around a meal. And we might discuss it and work out when some of us are free and we might think, well, let's, let's go with Wednesdays after work. We can gather from five, we can have some nibbles and drinks and, and get to know each other a bit and then we can have the main course and then we can uh, have the video and discussion time then we can have coffee and dessert, and we can finish up by 9.30. That sounds fantastic and great for lots of people, and a model like that was something Rose and I were involved in. Um, we, we attended ourselves. It wasn't Alpha. It was a marriage course um, some years ago before we had kids. But the thing is, 5 p.m. on a weeknight is an impossible time for most families with kids especially single parent families, uh, some that they're trying to love. They just can't do it. Instead, we need to think of options that would work for them. So maybe a Saturday, and maybe we run uh, a kids group alongside that so that kids can go to the group and parents can do Alpha. Or maybe we don't try to do a group at all. Maybe we meet one-on-one -on -one with individuals at a time that suits them and do Alpha like that. To finish, I want to think about the final verse from our 1 Corinthians reading. Paul says, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share its blessings. While the reason that we're doing mission to families is to love them and serve them, because God loves them and cares for them, there are also benefits for us. One of these relates to a question that came up in our strategic feedback a couple of months ago. The question was about how we're doing pastoral care as a church. Questions like, uh, when people need pastoral care in the church, how do others find out about it? Or when people want to help and serve in pastoral care, how do they know what to do, who to connect to, how do we make sure that we're not missing people on the fringe or people who have dropped off. And these are great questions and parish councils working actively on structures to help with this. But as we dig in to mission, we'll find that one of the best types of pastoral care is actually being on mission together for a purpose outside ourselves, serving other people. That's where we will build relationships that are built on something substantial. For example, going through the experience with your community group of deciding, let's, as a group, let's do something practically to serve those in need. And going through that process, the partnership required, the, the challenge and planning and doing it, and then celebrating and having shared experiences. 
that builds relationships that no system or structure can ever surpass in terms of past good because then people will know each other and, and be invested in each other and know when past good there is as well. It doesn't need to be going out there and doing uh, hard stuff. It can be with a group of people that matches whatever you are able to do. It could be a mission prayer group, a local mission prayer group, praying hard for particular people and, and finding out how things are going for them and celebrating uh, God's answers to those prayers. I do all things for the sake of the gospel that I may share its blessings. Being involved in mission is great for us. And we'll also see blessings as a whole church. One of the things that people who study outreach and mission have found is that time and time again, when churches focus on a particular people group to try to reach out to them, they end up attracting people from all groups. This happened at, at the Estates Church. We had lots of people who started coming to church from who lived on the Estates, but I think we had even more who didn't. Because people heard about that mission and thought, that sounds fantastic. They're really doing mission. I want to be part of that. So focusing our outreach on a particular group, it's not neglecting some people for the sake of others. It's taking seriously the fact that God has motivated and called our church, all of us, no matter what the demographic, th this isn't the way we run church. We're a church for all people. But in our outreach, we want to serve a particular people strategically. And so we're all called to love and serve families in need. And it means that as we do this, we do it as God's people because we know that this is God's heart. He lifts up those who are bowed down. He cares specially for them. And it means rolling up our sleeves and taking practical steps to do it so that we and all who receive God's love will be blessed as we put our hope in the one who can keep us, the Lord our God. Let's pray. O oh God, the fountain of life, to a humanity parched with thirst, you offer the living water that springs from the rock, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Stir up within your people the gift of your spirit, that we may profess our faith with freshness and announce with joy the wonder of your love. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.